Hi, uh, my name is Uma Ramakrishnan, uh, and I'm an associate professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences uh, in Bangalore, India. Uh, this is a research institute where we study biology, uh, and I've come all the way from there to tell you a little bit about uh, biogeography uh, and the work that we do uh, on understanding biodiversity in the Indian subcontinent. So um, anywhere you live, uh, if you look outside your window, you'll see many different species. This is biodiversity. And as humans, we are fascinated by biodiversity. Um, and biogeography actually is a field which studies the distribution of species or biodiversity across space. Um, and you know, the, you know immediately, uh, even as a child, that certain places have more species than others. Uh, the species in a particular place seem to be similar and so on. You observe these things almost naturally. Uh, and this is basically how we measure biodiversity and how we study it. Uh, we try and quantify biodiversity and look at why places have more diversity than do others. So how do we quantify biodiversity? How do we actually uh, use mathematical ways to study patterns of biodiversity, statistical ways across the world? So the first thing we do is we actually count the number of species, right? Uh, this is something which has often been controversial in biology. How do we know what is a species? Uh, taxonomists, uh, and as humans, we have this desire to put things in boxes uh, and say this is one species, this is another. Uh, and in some cases, this might be relatively easy. Uh, for example, with apes, uh, you know, the gibbon, uh, gibbons look very different from gorillas and chimpanzees and from humans. Uh, and when we look at their DNA, uh, there are several of these differences which are reflected, allowing us to build a phylogenetic tree. Um, you'll hear about this also, for example, in Scott Edwards' talk. Um, so this allows us to understand uh, that there are m multiple species of apes uh, which look different and are genetically different, distinct as well. This may not always be the case. For example, this really beautiful example of a ring species, salamanders uh, in, the, in, in California, it shows you here that across their distribution, uh, these different salamanders look slightly different and yet similar, right? So here, uh, speciation or these different species are along a continuum, right? Uh, they look slightly different. One looks slightly different from the other and so on. So it's not always easy to uh, classify species, but overall we use various tools, morphology, how species and indivi how individuals in a population look, uh, genetics, how different or similar their DNA is, uh, and it could be several other forms of behavior. Do they have similar songs if they're birds and so on? And we use all of these bits of information to make an informed guess about whether we think sets of individuals are distinct species or not. For the sake of correctness, um, I should tell you that the biological species concept proposed by Ernst Meyer is what we accept. Uh, and this suggests that a species is a group of individuals that can or do interbreed with each other in nature. So not if you put them together in a zoo, but in nature you do find uh, them interbreeding. And as we said, uh, species could look or similar or different, uh, but at some point we take a call and we say, okay, this is a species and these two populations are not distinct enough to be a species. So once we have cataloged species, that's the first thing we have to do. These are our primary data. We measure biodiversity in units of species. So how do species actually evolve? I mean, we said, okay, they look different or, you know, uh, they're genetically different. Well, this has also been a field of extensive study in evolutionary biology. And you may have seen a talk uh, as part of this series by Hopi Hoekstra, who's actually trying to understand how these differences between how species look evolve from a genetic perspective, right? Adaptation from a DNA level. Uh, but this uh, picture here shows you a really simple kind of theoretical idea of speciation. So the most basic uh, is allopatry over here, where you can see that there's two pop there's a population, and suddenly potentially there's a barrier between uh, two parts of this population. Maybe a road came up, or there was a, a you know a rift or something like that, a river, uh, and now uh, individuals on either side of this barrier uh, develop different adaptations, or they become different. And so when they meet again, 
let's say when this barrier disappears, they don't interbreed with each other. So this has now resulted in the creation of two species from where what was a single uh, population, right? So this is a case of allopatric speciation uh, and often what we see most commonly uh, in nature. On the other hand, speciation could theoretically also be sympatric where you have uh, a new, for some reason, change, uh, ecological change maybe or adaptation uh, of some individuals in one of the, in this population and this results in differentiation uh, and over time these differences became, become so large that uh, these two populations do not interbreed. An example for this uh, is the Ragolitus flies or the apple flies and the hawthorn flies which uh, lay their eggs on different fruits. Uh, apple and hawthorn apple orchards coexist, so they're sympatric these flies, and yet um, you know they they do become uh, could become different species. There are kind of shades and grades of these two examples where you could have speciation in peripatry or parapatry, uh, a creation of a new niche or you know a certain kind of budding off of a set of individuals and so on, a range expansion. Uh, but basically uh, the the mechanisms are somewhere between sympatry and allopatry. While these are nice examples from a theoretical thought uh, perspective, um, what do we know about speciation? So early on, uh, Dodd did experiments with Drosophila where, um, you know, different populations of flies were given uh, two different kinds of food uh, and over time these two uh, flies, fly, fly populations uh, became differentiated uh, and then they developed mating preferences. So uh, flies from population one didn't want to mate with flies from population two uh, and vice versa. So this is very important because it shows that not only did they become different, they developed uh, reproductive preferences and potentially reproductive isolation. What's most important for the lack of gene flow or mating in the end uh, between two uh, species. So now go, we go back to biogeography, which is basically the distribution of species uh, on our planet, right? So how do we actually study this? Um, in a sense, it's one of those, the most basic things, even before people thought about DNA or evolution, uh, a lot of naturalists walked all over the world uh, and did surveys and cataloged uh, interesting things about biodiversity. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt was one of these people um, and he uh, basically did a lot of explorations uh, and studies in South America and this beautiful illustration he has of this uh, mountain uh, Chimborazo uh, in South America which is a volcanic mountain uh, which goes really high 6200 or so meters. Um, he shows that actually as you go up the mountain the ecological environment changes dramatically. So you can see, for example, at the top of this mountain, you have snow, right? And that's not there at the bottom of the mountain. Uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, covered with snow at all. So what uh, Humboldt did was he also cataloged the plants uh, at the, uh, along this mountain. He was a botanist and he said, well, it seems to be that there are very different species very different sets of species which occur across this mountain. And this famous and really beautiful illustration he made kind of shows this, shows the community of plants associated with these environmental gradients. And so Humboldt thought early on that ecology or differences in habitat might be important to determine where species are distributed. Um, the father of evolutionary biology, Darwin, uh, also had uh, contributions to thinking about biogeography. So Darwin, as you know, uh, went on this really long voyage uh, across the world on the Beagle. Uh, and he, while he was going on this voyage, he thought about all the species present uh, along this route. Uh, and he actually happened to go to South America and then later to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, and when he did that, he noticed something really interesting. He saw many birds on the Galapagos Islands. They looked similar to the ones he'd seen on the mainland and yet different, right? So Darwin realized that potentially the species that occur in a location may be there uh, because of history, because they're colonizing there from somewhere close by. And so the finches are similar to those on the mainland and yet they're different. Uh, most interestingly also, Alfred Russell Wallace 
uh, around the same time as Darwin. Uh, he was a co-discoverer of the theory of natural selection with Darwin. They chanced upon the idea together in the same time, not together, but at the same, at similar times, uh, was also a very avid explorer. And he also uh, studied distributions of species across the world. And what he did was he actually realized that certain sets of species seem to be more similar to each other. And these sets of species seem to occur in similar locations. Okay? So he tried to group the species in the world into uh, bins in a sense, not just one species, but sets of species. And he, for example, suggested that all of the Orient, which is uh, Southeast Asia uh, and India, was one um, biogeographic zone or grouping. Um, and it's interesting to note that very recently, in 2013, Holt and other authors actually kind of re-evaluated Wallace's ideas of these biogeographic zones uh, based on modern DNA phylogeny. So uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and Darwin are pre-DNA. They didn't know anything about, uh, you know, the kind of hereditary material that we know so much about today, uh, which we used to study evolution. And uh, they also found very similar results to what Wallace had found um, so many uh, years ago. So now we can look then, uh, we, we are looking uh, with modern tools of uh, GIS and DNA and so on, and we can now look at biodiversity and ask questions in biogeography. And this actually shows you a distribution of vertebrate species across the world. Uh, and you can see immediately, anyone can see that some areas have more diversity than others, and this tends to be in the tropics. So of course here, uh, the colder colors or blues are areas with lower numbers of species, and the warmer reds are regions with higher numbers of species. Um, what I'm also going to try and convince you is that if you actually were to plot onto this map mountain ranges, you would see that mountain ranges tend to correlate with areas where there are high species. And we'll come back to this in a little bit. There's other ways to look at species, right? You can just count all of them, but you can also ask whether some places have more restricted range species or higher endemism. Do some places have more special species which are not found anywhere else? This is also an important thing for us to understand when thinking about bioge biogeography and biodiversity. So we can quantify this by quantifying endemism or how restricted a species range is to a geographic location. And when we do this, again we find, you know, really interesting patterns. We find, for example, superimposing our mountains again, that endemism or special species tend to be also found in areas where there are mountains and very interestingly also on islands, okay? So islands, mountains and the tropics seem to be important uh, for presence of species. So how do we actually study why there's more biodiversity in a particular location? So okay, so why may there be more species in a particular place? Well, clearly there's more speciation there. Maybe there's less extinction. Speciation increases the numbers of species while extinction might decrease the number of species. So clearly the balance or diversification the balance between speciation and extinction must be high. There must be a net positive rate of diversification. And we can actually quantify speciation rate and extinction by looking at phylogenies. And so in this paper, Roland et al. tried to do this. And what they did was they contrasted the net uh, accumulation of biodiversity or diversification uh, amongst the tropics and amongst the temperate regions. And what you can see here in this really beautiful graph is, if you look at speciation, it's higher uh, in, the, in the tropics. Uh, extinction seems to be much higher in temperate regions. And so overall, on an average, it appears like diversification, that's net diversification over there, is much higher in the tropics. So this suggests that um, the tropics are cradles of diversity, which means that new species are being created here, right? They are also museums. There's less extinction. So they retain these species over longer periods of time. So because they're both cradles and museums, tropical regions overall 
tend to have higher biodiversity. Uh, islands, as we pointed out earlier, are also a really interesting case. Uh, this is a very interesting figure from uh, a review, a uh, recent review by Lozos and Rickliffs, where they actually uh, suggest a model for how something like this may happen. They basically verbalize what Darwin thought those many years ago, that you may have a finch which moves from the mainland onto one island. Uh, these islands are different, and so it manages to disperse to all these islands over time. And then slowly, these uh, finches or birds maybe differentiate over time. They become adapted to the conditions on that particular island. Uh, and then maybe if there's further speciation in allopatry, um, you have recolonization of these different birds across these different islands now and further speciation. So islands are really nice because they're excellent models to study speciation. So because they're small and they're in the ocean, uh, environmental conditions can vary very dramatically on islands. And any of you who've been to an island know it's suddenly raining or it's suddenly there's a storm. So it's, they're very um, easy to see environmental changes on. Uh, at the same time, because there are many islands often in a sea, uh, there are natural barriers which exist between islands. So we can clearly see a role for history. There's a mainland close by, uh, ecology, differences between islands or within an island, uh, and things like dispersal, right, where differences can actually come based on islands across space. So let's look at a couple of examples of speciation uh, and its study on islands. So, uh, you know, one of the most uh, biodiverse islands we have in the world is Madagascar. Uh, it's a really interesting place because it has a very unique set of species uh, found nowhere else. And I show you here a map, uh, uh, a picture of birds. Uh, these are called vangas. And these have diversified on Madagascar. So you can see below there, there's a map which shows the different kind of uh, ecological conditions or habitats within Madagascar. And here you can see a phylogeny, a DNA-based tree uh, of all these birds, which allows us to infer who evolved from whom and who colonized which environment first and so on. And so here we can see an example of ecological speciation, right? Uh, diversification uh, of these birds into different niches, uh, different habitats on this island uh, of Madagascar. Uh, and uh, actually, if you look at Madagascar, there's also incredibly rich uh, vertebrate diversity uh, in terms of reptiles and amphibians. And these maps uh, on this side actually show you uh, those types of diversity. They show you where there are more or less species. And you can see, for example, that diversity tends to be high in some environments, higher than, say, in others. So wetter environments, uh, which you can see below, actually tend to have higher diversity than drier environments. So again, examples of ecologically driven speciation within uh, an island and a place with high biodiversity. Um, on the other hand, you can also have geographic examples of speciation. So here we see uh, these insects uh, and the Hawaiian island chain. So the nice thing about the Hawaiian island chain is the different islands have different ages, right? So the oldest island is Kauai, and the youngest island is Hawaii. And you can look and see this also in the phylogeny. So for example, uh, the authors have very nicely colored these islands uh, in different colors. And the insects found on those islands are in the phylogeny in the same color. So if you look down, for example, you can see, you can see this order. You can say green, orange, purple, blue and red, right? So in terms of time, the oldest island is green, and then there's orange, and then there's purple, and then there's blue, and then there's red. And you can see that reflected in the phylogenetic tree as well. So speciation has progressed with time, and you have these different islands being colonized, uh, and these different species diverging uh, across the Hawaiian island chain. So lineages or sets of individuals which are closer together from a DNA perspective, uh, are related on an island. Younger lineages are on younger islands. And genetic data kind of helps us explore the history of speciation on these islands. So now, 
I've been kind of alternating between mountains and islands, slipping in uh, the fact that mountain ranges have high biodiversity. Why was I doing this? Well, it turns out, as uh, Humboldt showed us, and this is an example from uh, the US, uh, the Southwest, uh, mountains also have islands. They have habitat islands. As you go up a mountain, you can see that the habitat or the ecology actually changes. Higher parts of the mountain are different than the lower parts of the mountain. And so you might imagine that ecologically, species would become adapted to live in these specialized environments. And then if you look at the mountain range, that's like a set of islands, kind of like Hawaii in a sense, right? So it might be interesting to try and explore patterns of speciation or the accumulation of biodiversity uh, in mountain chains. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about in terms of our research. But the best part of it all is, is the history of this speciation is actually written in the DNA of these species, of the populations which actually live on these islands. Our way to look at their past is through sequencing their DNA. Um, this is also important. It's not just fun. But, uh, you know, our existence as humans is critically dependent on biodiversity. There are many studies which show us now that human well-being, not just from an uh, aesthetic perspective, but in terms of our ecosystem services and many, many things, is critically dependent on biodiversity. Uh, and this allows us to really prioritize studying areas of high biodiversity. It's important to us. It's not just interesting. Uh, and these uh, can be classified globally as biodiversity hotspots, not just regions where there is high, high biodiversity, but also regions where there are threats to this biodiversity. And two of the regions I'm going to talk to you about today happen to be biodiversity hotspots, uh, the Western Ghats, which is in India, in southern India, and the Himalayas, which is in the northern part of Asia. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you know, we're really interested in understanding biodiversity, but it's also critically important from a conservation perspective. This understanding, we hope, will help us to think about how we can save these species in the future. So I'll just summarize and uh, kind of give a, a leap into our research questions, which I'm going to talk about in the next part of this talk. Uh, biodiversity is higher in the tropics, uh, in mountain ranges and in islands. Uh, and the barriers which cause allopatric speciation or the creation of biodiversity could be physical or ecological. Um, but what still remains for us to explore is whether what's driving speciation is really different or the same in various locations across the world. Um, and you saw, for example, that study, um, you know, from uh, Madagascar on vangas, right? It's a particular type of bird. But you could also think about this from the perspective of all the species which live in a location. Do they all respond similarly to these different barriers or changes in ecology? How generalizable are these patterns? Uh, how important are physical differences? Are they more important to some species versus others or not? Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next talk. Thank you.